like how to do it. I'm just gonna take my pants off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Here we are. Here we are with all these great drummers. You know, this is this is like the epitome of what goes on in uh, in the Boston area as far as drumming and gigging is concerned. So these guys are the professionals. They're here because they are always performing. And uh, we're just gonna ask them some questions. So we'll start with Chris Anzalone. Um, Chris, I noticed uh, you're always gigging, man. Uh, every time I turn on Facebook, you have a new gig that you're posting. Tell us, how is it that you actually get so many gigs? What's the process like? How do you maintain them? And um... well, I lie. I lie. Those <laughs> no, 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 actually have a single gig. <laughs> They're all. <laughs> This is going to go really well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, actually, it was funny. You, you asked that before we started filming, and, and, and I thought about it just for a second. And, you know, a, a huge a huge thing was when I first started getting gigs was from other drummers. Uh, you know, that that's, that's like almost square one. You know what I mean? Meeting Mike 20-something years ago. I mean, I've probably known Mike here longer than anybody. Well, I've known him, you know. But, uh, and, and just, you know, going like, hey, you know. Oh wow, you sounded good at that jam, you know, given, having somebody give you their number. You know, uh, all of us here have all gotten each other gigs, just calls, whether it's subbing or just, hey, I heard about a band that I think you'd be good at. And, you know, and, and luckily enough, you know, like, I been very, was very lucky to have guys like Mike. And I remember John McGovern got me on a bunch of gigs back in the, you know, the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. So there's that, just getting the ball rolling, you know what I mean, back, like, early on. You know what I mean? You need somebody to help you out. You need like you know peers, and uh, either drummers or non-drummers. Just you know, just getting your gigs. You so know? it's networking, is what you're saying. I mean, the networking is is just is just huge. What would you do to network? I mean, you know Mike, and you know John McGovern, but what would you do to network if you didn't know these guys? Going out is is a big thing. Going out and meeting people and making the scene and seeing other bands. And, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a gig from, from somebody and they'll say, uh, yeah, here, I'll send you the CDs, but, you know, you come to my gig every week, you know, you, you know the tunes, you know, and that's from being out. Uh -huh. You can learn someone's book just from going to see their residency every week, you yeah. know, we'll learn it to a certain degree, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's, that's huge, you know what I mean? Uh, it, it's, it's not everything being out, but I think it's, it's big. A lot of times I'll walk through the door of a bar and someone will go like, oh dude, we were just saying we needed somebody for the 24th, you know. Right. There you are. You're right there. You're right in front of them. Yeah, that's you know, fantastic. It's a, it's a very social business. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I can sort of say it on the other side because I've been, since I've moved, you know, out to the burbs kind of, and I'm not a real, you know, I don't call people up all the time looking for stuff. So consequently, you know, I don't play as much. And I know a lot of it's just because I'm not there. You know, I go in to see Dennis Brennan once in a blue moon, and, you know, guys are like, oh, hey, how you doing? But, you know, he's not going to call me. There's no problem. I'm not, I'm not dissing Dennis. I'm just saying that I can definitely see it from the other side that if you don't stay on top of it, um, which is harder, you know, for me because I'm older too. It's like, uh -huh. do I really want to go out, you know, at 10 o'clock on a weeknight? to see some band because I might get a gig, you know, I'm kind of like... But the yeah. thing is, Jerome, you've already done that. You, exactly. You've paid those dues. Well, you yeah, know. but I mean, it's still, you notice that, that if you're not out there, the things like he says yeah. where you just show up, sometimes it's just a question of being fresh in somebody's mind. Yep. Yeah. Right. You know, like he said, you know, like, you get a gig, like, that's where I say, you know, even if it's a lame wedding gig, to a certain extent, you might want to take it because you don't know who the bass player might be or the keyboard exactly. player. And they might, you know, the next day they've got a really great recording session and somebody's looking for a drummer and they're like, oh, this guy I played with yesterday, mm -hmm. you know, and you get it because right. you're just the closest thing, you know, uh -huh. you know we, can't, we, we can't remember, you know, two days ago, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, and Com competent players are a commodity. It doesn't matter how many people, how large a group, a sample group that, that musicians are that are available for gigs, it's... If there's a certain amount of competency that you've shown, it's people are gonna kind of well, you know, we have three guys we could call, but we really want to call that guy because sure. the last time we played him, he was a cool guy. He showed up on time. His gear sounded great. Yep. Uh, it was a good hang. It wasn't a dick. You know, <laughs> it, it really made it kind of you know everybody was kind of psyched. It brought a different you know feeling to the to this the same 
150 tunes that we play all the time and it just felt really great and you know let's let's talk to him some more you know and and that sort of spreads because it is a small uh social group yeah and that stuff sort of uh it gets around real quick and then you start getting phone calls from guys that you know i kind of heard of you but you know why are you calling me i mean what, how did that happen what was what so was it and then it's sort of, it's like an, it's like an osmosis. It's right. a personality thing is a good yeah. point, too. It's, uh, you know, being, being, knowing how to be <laughs> right. on the gig, you right. know, knowing how to, like, just be a cool guy. And on not, the gig you know, or also outside of the gig, well, trying to get the whole gig. thing. Just the whole, yeah, the whole yeah. hang and getting yeah. along. I mean, yeah, when you're networking, you know, you don't want to be, you know, the guy who shows up at the club, like, hey, man. If you ever need to sit, <laughs> that kind of thing. There are definitely things you could. You're pretty good. At that. Yeah, hey, yeah, wow. You know, I remember talking to Billy Ward one time, and he was saying how he was just about to go ask for the cover of Modern Drummer. And he was talking to Bill Miller when he was still around, and Bill was like, "Oh, some jerk just called me up and asked for the cover." You know, and Billy was like, "Okay, note to self, don't ever do that." You know. So it's like it's like that. You've all seen the guy who's like. You know, yeah, it's one thing to network, but you don't want to be the guy like, oh, if you ever need a sub. Yeah. You, you know, sometimes you got to let that stuff come to you a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so sure, not this, pushing it, yeah. this is uh, Jerome Dupree. Um, I, we already introduced you to Chris Anzalone. Uh, Jerome's the, the former drummer of Morphine. He's the former drummer of Morphine? Well, the original drummer. The and, original, uh, right? One he's, of two. <laughs> he's, he is the Jerome Dupree. He's, he's <laughs> gig quite extensively uh, all over the world, probably. And, um, and Troy Velasquez jumped in as well. He's over here. Um, and he is gigging all the time around. Boston as well. And you know, before they turned on the camera, Steve Shigaris over here mentioned to Jerome, why is it that I'm on that gig tonight, not you? So <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. Well, this is a, the Jeff Robinson Trio is a gig I've had for over 10 years um, at the Lizard Lounge every Sunday night improvising behind poets. Uh -huh. And Steve's been one of the subs that we've called. But like I said, I've been actually out of commission for several months now with uh, tendonitis in first the right elbow and now both of them. Okay. So I have not been doing either of my two steady gigs for the entire summer anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a while my my uh, friend Phil Neighbors, who's also a, you know, just like any of these guys, um, he was doing it and they wanted to experiment with some other drummers. So I guess you've been doing it a bit or I don't know who all's been doing it. But yeah. Yeah. So, so Steve, tell us about the gig. <laughs> Um, well, the, the, how I got the call? Yeah, I mean, because this is about how do we get gigs, how, how, you know, how does the drummer go out and, and expose themselves, so to speak. That's the easy part, exposing <laughs> yourself. <laughs> You're real good at that. <laughs> we, this is a common theme. <laughs> Recurring. Uh, I got a different email. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I know... Well, uh, there, there, this is a sort of there's a, a lot of things going on here. Um, uh, the the musicians that that Jerome is playing with in this trio, Blake Newman and Jeff Robinson, are are all mutual friends. Um, Blake and I have an, another trio that uh -huh. we play in. Right. Um, what is the name of that trio? Tough Love Trio. The truck, which the is tough love trio. more of a standardy contemporary jazz trio that right. I, that I, I lead. It's a small sort of side project because I wasn't getting called for any jazz gigs anymore and I figured I'm just going to book my own jazz gigs once in a while so I got Blake and another guitar player and um, so so we have common friends mm -hmm. and um, and I had subbed for uh, before uh, I was going to say yeah you did it before yeah before before Jerome Jerome's been doing it for a decade but um, that gig has been running like 17 years uh, now. I don't think it's quite that long but it's a long time it's been a long it's been wow. many years they've been, they've held this spot at the Lizard Lounge on Sunday nights it's been, it's been something that that, uh, that Jeff Robinson has has, has uh, really built uh, there for for many many years um, and they had an original uh, drummer named Dwight um, I can't remember. Oh God, forgive, yeah, I can't me. Remember his... forgive me. I can't yeah, remember his yeah. last name. He moved to Bermuda, and he's working as a full-time drummer. He's originally from Bermuda. He moved back. He's he's a full-time drummer there. But um, anyhow, I subbed because Blake and I have known each other even back then. So right. it was just uh, 
you know, the, the, when I said it's sort of multifaceted, it's not only just because we're friends who maybe went to similar schools and had similar friends. It, it's also um, levels of trust too. Um, I, I know with any of these guys here that um, if I needed a sub, that um, these guys are going to play selflessly. You, you know, that right. it's going to be about the bigger picture of the gig and not, about the you know, I'm Mike A and, you know, this is a great opportunity for me to be Mike right now on this stage. Right. <laughs> and, you know, um, everyone just look out. You know, it's not, it, I mean, because that's, I think, I, I'm almost certain that that the reason why we're here is because we're not the guys that are making the YouTube videos. <laughs> not, nothing against that, nothing against that at all, but, but our, our, the, the singer-songwriter scene is very heavy here, mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of great writers here, mm -hmm. and, and so I think we've all sort of come up as like, you know, wow, there's so much original music here to like, figure out how to interpret and, and get inside and so there's levels of trust and I know that um, I know that with any one of these guys I could I could say okay I, I definitely could rely on a sub to go in and 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 set the right priority and so they would as, as well for you and then that's how you might get some of these gigs because Mike Mike Aiello might call you and say I need a sub for this gig I, I hope that that would be the, 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 the thing, is it wouldn't be like, um, you know, I'm, I'm calling Steve because his paradiddle is at 220 or whatever. 220? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's impressive. 220. Yeah. Believe me, it is. I'm at 221. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, not, to, not to interrupt, but this, this seems like an appropriate spot. Uh, uh, having been fired from a gig for sending someone who... Uh, I hadn't personally seen, but just by reputation oh, only. Yeah. Um, uh, it happened, uh, you know. When it was but was it because they didn't do a good job or they got the gig? It was, no, it was because they didn't do a good job. There was a three night gig uh, with uh, it was some cover band. They'll remain nameless. The drummer will remain nameless. Good. Um, wow. I, uh, it was a three night gig and I was doing the first and the third night. And I had another engagement on the second night. Uh, I sent the sub. Uh, we had a. I had gone and seen him play with another band. It was a lot of the same songs. I figured it was cool. Um, didn't really know the whole book, but uh, I couldn't find anybody else. And uh, I sent him this gig, and uh, it didn't go well. Uh, the front man was also a drummer by trade, and had actually asked him to stop playing and to go have go build up a bar tab, and the front man sang from behind the drums the rest of the night. And I showed up, I showed up the, the next night with my gear, and uh, one of the horn players on the, on the hip was, uh, he's like, dude, this is gonna be your last gig with this guy, I promise you, because the guy you sent, it was just really, really bad. Oh. And well, so oh, that's that's I, did, I did my very best to find you know yeah. someone who I had known uh, to to get into that spot because you really want to send somebody who's who's competent and 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 in, in most cases more competent than you are. Yeah. And uh, that was a mistake. That's very important. Uh, and and I was told uh, you know not more than twenty minutes later uh, before you know getting onto the bandstand that it was um, yeah you don't do that. You're you're gonna you're done. Mm. <laughs> and it wasn't anything that, other, other that's, than that's funny. funny. But yeah, I right. mean, I, you know, so, I mean, I can understand getting a comment about it, but to lose the gig yeah, over it in, in a cover band, band, no less. Yeah, that's exactly, like, exactly. But that much, shows you yeah. how important it is to send out people right, to the gigs right. that you know. Yeah. So, so Mike Aiello, this is Mike Aiello. Um, you've played many years with many of the blues gigs around Boston. Uh, tell us how you got the gigs. Um, for me. Um, much like what Chris was saying, uh, early on I hit every jam, I went to every gig, and I was out every night trying to make a name for myself. Many nights I go down to Wally's, um, you know, I had kids very early on, I was in my early 20s, and I I take care of all my duties uh, at the house, and I would set my alarm for like quarter or 12, 
I'd get up, I'd be down at Wally's by midnight, and I'd hang out there from 12 to 2. <laughs> and, and many times I'd, I'd sit there, and I wouldn't even get called up to play. Um, but after just weeks of going there and playing with some of the beginning, you know, lower echelon, you know, with all due respect, you know, just because they didn't know me, they put me up there with whoever, and then eventually they could see that I could play, yeah. and the more they let me play, the better I became. Right. And the better players I got up there with, you know, they took me to school, and... The more opportunities happened for them to call you for gigs. More ap opportunities right. happened to call me for gigs, and, and uh, I used to sub for this cat, Roscoe Hammer, and he was a old school blues guy. Kill. He was a bus driver by day. <laughs> and this guy had the meanest pocket you ever heard. Wow. And, yeah, and big time. And um, I was very lucky to become friends with him, and and um, and he would send me on gigs with some really great players, man. And 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 you know, like I said, I got my butt kicked. Um, so I mean, that's how I started getting into the scene, and eventually got into some really good bands. Um, that led to other great bands, you know. Me and Chris shared a gig with uh, Matt Woodburn and, and Cheryl Arena. I held the gig for about four or five wow. years. Then when I left that gig, um, I put in a good word for Chris, and, and they really liked him, and he was coming to a lot of jams that I was playing on at the House of Blues. And that camaraderie, that sense of networking and community came into play. And, you know, Mike, what do you think about Chris? Great, this is the guy you need for the job. And, and I moved on to some other groups. I, I was very lucky, got to play with Susan Tedeschi. I was on a record with her, uh, which led to um, a group called the Radio Kings. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. And I got to tour all over the States and, and went to Europe a bunch with them. Um, and, you know, the true teacher experience of experience came into play, you know. Right. Um, but a common thread here that I really feel I need to mention um, that gave a lot of us the tools to be able to do that. We all studied with Bob Gallardi. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, Everybody? Troy? Right? Oh, not Troy, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> but, okay, you can just leave. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Troy is, uh, Troy is an exceptional uh, musician. <laughs> Wait, I didn't say that. Drum. <laughs> There's no musicians here. Yeah. Oh! Yeah, all right, so be careful what you yeah. call me. Don't be calling anybody names like that. <laughs> So let me ask this to all of you guys. So it seems like all of you might have experience traveling with your gear. Oh, yeah. So, if, well, you just mentioned Europe. I think you've played in Europe, Jerome. You must have played. Over yeah, Europe. but I don't. These days, I, don't, I remember Steve talking about this. I don't. I take. I don't even take cymbals. So, Last few gigs I've done has all been drums du jour. Uh -huh. I take a stick bag, and that's it. I that's did that. Exactly. I did that a couple of years ago, and I, and I got burned. And so I just went to Norway with with my band Johnny Hoy, you know, and I I just. I checked on I checked on my uh, my snare and my my little you know my suitcase and and you know checked actually checked my cymbal bag and uh -huh. a nice big you know hide case just because yeah sometimes the, the drums du jour is great and sometimes it's you know, I just I just found you know with the <laughs> members of Morphine gig I never felt like oh the cymbal's gonna ruin it for me uh -huh. right you know right. yeah there might be there might be times you know plus you just can't going overseas you can't ship a drum set. You know, the one little bit of touring we did before I left the band in 92, we, you know, I flew a drum set to California for, you know, a little tour up and down the coast, but that was back in the day when you could tip the sky cap you know, 20 bucks and you could roll things together, you know. You got an entire drum set on one luggage tag, you know. And that was Mark's, you know, that was Mark's experience too, but since then, I've never, unless it's been driving, I've never taken my own gear. Well, the thing about playing on a kit over there is that, they, for one thing, they tend to have big, huge bass drums, big, uh -huh. like, you know, everything's, like, big, and, you know, so I'm, I'm small, I play a small kit, and so I take off half the shit they have right. on there. Yeah, I try to set up my kit yeah. away from home and try to make, you know, get make a little, as as you can. get a little nest, you know, and, uh, you, you just do it. You you, you you know. I don't want to say you suffer it, but you you just gotta kind of get with, you know, a different kind yeah, of. Yeah, the guy the guys who feel like oh I've got to play my drums and 
everything's got to be perfect. It's like good luck. Yeah, yeah. no, you're you, know, you get out in the real world, you never know what you're going to be asked to play. Yeah. What's your budget? How important it's going to be. Or the, you know, the story of Andy Newmark, you know, uh, auditioning for Sly Stone. On the practice bench. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's on a break. He's playing with at the Troubadour with, with uh, Carly Simon. And on the break, somebody drives him up into the Hollywood Hills to Sly's house. And, you know, they take him in this back room and he says it's all dark and, like, really sinister. And Sly's, like, you know, laid out on the bed, barely <laughs> conscious. You know, it's like... Sexy. Yeah, oh, hi, I'm Andy. Yeah. You know, are you a drummer? Yeah. Are you funky? Yes. You know, he's like, play something. And it was a practice pad kit. <laughs> you know? And it was like, I knew I had 20 seconds to make it or break it. Just sat down and played and Sly woke up like, okay, cool, you got the kid. <laughs> yada, 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 you know. And then he's back in the car going back for the next set with Carly. You know, wow. so you, That's you, fantastic. You can imagine if he'd gone, oh no, I don't play a practice pad kit. Yeah. I need my drums. <laughs> you I know. A good case in point earlier this summer was uh, we had to deal with a rental gear situation uh -huh. uh, in Florida. And it was a situation where the rental gear company came super highly recommended. They, you know, they had, uh, you know, they had cartage to the big venues, and and uh, we had, uh, you know, we had basically a week and a half to get it all straightened out with the logistics. And I traveled with uh, with a pedal and a stick bag and my snare drum uh, checked. Um, and we got into town. We got to this place, and everything was in, you know, the big road cases, and we we're. And you know we get it all to the location and just sort of assume that that uh, the gear was proper. Uh, right. What came out of the cases was less than adequate for a venue of the size that we were at, and uh, I had to work. Uh, I, yeah, I don't really do that much surgery on drums because <laughs> of my, my my gear is is pretty. You know, it, it comes out of the car sounding great, and. Uh, so it was a, a situation where we're playing, you know, the six or seven thousand people, and I have a drum kit that is uh, unpresentable, and now I have to do something with it. Yeah. And we were opening for a comedian, so there's really, you know, there's one front of house guy, and there's some microphones and a huge stage, and we're trying to figure out in 20 minutes, uh, get the stuff up there, get some line levels, and and. You know, and then we're going to be on in a couple hours, and uh, because I've only, you know, for the last I don't know, twelve or thirteen years now, I've been playing kick snare hats and a single cymbal, and I'm addicted to that, and I never ever want to change. Uh, I was on this huge, huge stage, and I couldn't get the toms to do anything, and they were coming through the house, and they're just awful, and and the house sound guy is just like, can you do something with those? Um, well, yeah, I think I can do something with that. <laughs> <laughs> Good response. Get rid of that crap.